Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Lomomatic 110, a new pocket sized camera that takes 110 film cartridges. Yes, 110 film, the often forgotten format invented by Kodak in 1972, popular during the following decade, then mostly abandoned by the late 80s for the more established and better quality 35mm. But 110 actually had a lot going for it easier to load possible to swap mid-roll by only sacrificing one frame, and no need to rewind when you're done. Sure, the negatives were roughly one quarter the size of 35mm, but that meant smaller cameras. And besides, who doesn't love a bit of grain, right? I know I did. Back in the late 70s, my very first camera was a Hanamex, very much like this one, which took 110 film. This is the format that launched my passion for photography, so when Lomography announced their new Lomomatic 110, I took it for a nostalgic walk down memory lane. Lomography fans will know the company has become the sole saviour of the 110 format over the past decade, exclusively producing a variety of films for new and old 110 cameras, not to mention creating new cameras of their own. You're looking at about $8 or pounds for a 24 exposure roll of their most affordable 110 color negative film, but they also sell black and white and color options with various tints. The Lomomatic 110 is their latest 110 camera, launched in March 2024 and costing around $100 to $150 or pounds, depending on the finish and whether it includes the detachable flash accessory. It's pitched as an advanced model with a glass lens, two aperture settings, the chance to take multiple or bulb exposures, and supporting, again, that removable flash accessory. It may be a new camera, but unapologetically retro styled, kind of like a vintage Kodak Instamatic. Lomography sent me the light beige version with orange highlights to live out my 1970s fantasy. Measuring 112 by 35 by 44 mil for the main body, it's more square shaped from the end than the typically deeper original 110 cameras, kind of like how you remember Mars bars being before they shrunk, or before you grew up. Weighing 113 grams with battery, but no film, it'll easily slip into a pocket. The camera is powered by a single CR2 battery, which fits into a compartment on the right side. But beyond this, there's no apparent controls beyond an unlabeled black lever, nor any obvious means to access the film compartment or compose a shot. But fear not, grip the right hand side and you can pull the body open with a satisfying ratchet sound to reveal everything you need. From the front, the lens becomes visible, and from the rear, you can now peer through the optical viewfinder to compose your shot. Meanwhile, labelling alongside the black lever at the end lets you manually set the focusing distance to 0 0.8, 1.5, 3 meters, or infinity. A panel on the top unveils the rectangular shutter release button, along with two tiny buttons to adjust the film sensitivity between 100 and 400 ISO, or set the bulb mode for exposures up to 30 seconds, while you keep the shutter button held down. On the opposite side of the camera, underneath, is a switch for night or day, which basically sets the lens aperture to f2.8 or f5.6 respectively. Below this is an MX switch, which allows you to make multiple exposures by recocking the shutter mechanism as many times as you like without winding the film on. Speaking of the film, extending the camera also reveals a switch to open the main compartment. To load the film, simply insert the cartridge with no need to pull out a strip as you would with 35mm. It really is very easy. Meanwhile, to wind the film on, just push the camera closed and pull it open again, repeating until frame 1 is indicated in the window on the back. You're then ready to shoot by pushing the silver release button on the top. To advance the film to the next frame, just push the camera closed. I found the mechanism didn't always grab the sprocket on the film, so you may need to repeat that open and close motion a couple more times until the film is gripped properly and advances to the next frame, indicating the number in the window on the back. And don't worry, once it has advanced, you can open and close the camera as many times as you like. You're not going to advance the film and waste any pictures. The glass lens is described as a Minotaur 23mm, and when comparing the field of view to a 35mm or full frame camera, I found it delivered roughly 50mm or standard coverage. Unlike some vintage 110 cameras though, there's no lever to switch it to a different focal length. Beyond the bulb option, the shutter speed is fully automatic based on the aperture and the ISO settings, and of course the available light. In theory, the night and day switch could give you some control over the depth of field, while deliberately setting the ISO value too high or too low could act as simple exposure compensation, but really I'd consider the Lomomatic 110 a mostly automatic experience. Lomography also supplies some bundles with a flash accessory that screws into the end of the main body. 
This in turn is powered by the camera's battery and lets you set it to off, fill or always on. There's also a small slot into which you can slide coloured filters for different coloured flash effects. To see what it could do, I ran a few of Lomography's own Colour Tiger 200 ISO cartridges through it on the streets of Brighton under a variety of lighting conditions. I had my films processed by my local lab, Colourstream, who charged £12 for developing and a set of postcard sized prints. They can also do digital scans if you like. I chose a matte finish for that vintage 1970s look. Note that the common 6x4 inch print is a little bit wider than a frame of 110 film, so choosing it at your lab will result in cropping a bit from the top and bottom of your pictures. So if your lab can do it, ask for a slightly squarer shape like say 6x4 and a half inch. Or extra bonus points to labs like Colorstream for exactly matching the 110 shape by dialing in a custom 6x4.4 inch size. It's always worth asking them. Now 110 is a small format, so it's happiest under bright sunny conditions. With the sun facing the subject and the focus set correctly, the Lomomatic 110 could certainly capture well exposed images with crisp details and just enough of that visible grain for an attractive vintage look. These are definitely more detailed than the 110 photos that I remember from my childhood. I found the basic optical viewfinder did a fair job at matching the coverage that I ended up capturing, at least for more distant subjects. As you get closer to your subject, you may experience some parallax errors where your framing will become less accurate, so bear that in mind. Also remember, if you're printing 6x4 inch, you will be cropping the top and bottom from your photos, so compose accordingly. Or again, just ask your lab for a shape that better matches 110 film. I found it's fairly easy to fool the metering though, with even mildly backlit scenes often becoming underexposed in my test shots. Unless you're actually after a silhouette, I'd consider setting the ISO to a lower value than the film to force the camera into an overexposure. So if you're using 200 ISO film, setting the camera to 100 should effectively double the brightness, if that's what you desire. You'll also need to be careful to set the appropriate focusing distance on the lens, and appreciate that the minimum distance of 0.8 meters may still be a bit too far for certain subjects. Now it's been a while since I've personally tried multiple exposures with film, so I ended up with overexposed results. Since you're adding more light with each exposure, aim for dimmer subjects or deliberately underexposing them by, say, increasing the camera's ISO setting. I also tried a bit of light painting with my phone's torch by using the bulb mode in a darkened room. Your mileage may vary. It's also important to remember the limitations of 110, especially at lower sensitivities of 200 ISO. As the conditions get dimmer, the camera will happily set a slower shutter speed for the correct exposure, but these can quickly become too slow to handhold without any camera shake. The flash can also be a bit severe at close range, so again consider using it with a higher ISO value to underexpose, or slide in one of those coloured filters, or simply take the shot from a bit further away. Overall, the Lomomatic 110 is certainly a fun experience for anyone who wants to try out film photography and is happy to trade the quality of 35mm for an easier loading and unloading experience. It'll also deliver a heady dose of nostalgia to anyone who, like me, shot the format in the 70s and 80s. The ultimate quality is obviously going to be held back by the fairly small format, but once you understand the limitations, you can achieve some nice looking vintage styled images under the right conditions, and that glass lens really can deliver sharper results than budget 110 cameras. But there's no getting away from the camera's price, which turns it from a casual fun purchase into something less frivolous. This is a camera for someone who's more invested in getting the best out of 110, which puts it in a slightly uncomfortable position. If you're just after some affordable 110 fun, you could grab a basic vintage model from the 1970s for around a tenner on eBay or from many thrift shops. Or if you'd like a new camera, Lomography's own Diana Baby can be had for around £35. Conversely, if you want something more sophisticated with more control, there's a bunch of higher-end vintage 110 cameras you could bid on or look for in a garage sale which can still work out cheaper. As the sole producer of 110 film though, Lomography wins either way. They don't mind if you're shooting on true vintage or a modern camera. Personally, I love that companies like Lomography are keeping these different film formats alive, breathing new life into vintage cameras or offering options to those who'd prefer a new model. So even if the Lomomatic 110 isn't exactly the right camera for you, there will be an alternative film camera out there with your name on it. And that's it for this review. I hope you enjoyed it. Do let me know in the comments about your memories of 110 film, new or old, and whether you'd like me to review more analog cameras in the future. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.